Great. Okay. Well, listen, welcome to our 24th annual, or it's not annual, but 24th Zoom talk, fourth this year. And um, the Yakima and Sila Neighbors Network, I'm on the board. Um, we want to make sure that people have the choice of staying in their homes as they get older and as long as possible. And so we try to advocate for their needs of older adults in Yakima, develop programs that connect us and help us build new and deeper friendships and provide other services within the scope of our volunteers. And we want to really thank our sponsors. The importance of our sponsors to us is that they show us that the community recognizes that we're doing important work. So we thank Triply Construction. And we also thank uh, the Yakima Valley Community Foundation, United Way of Central Washington, and the Latino Community Fund that gave us a $5,000 grant recently. So this afternoon, we are so pleased to have Heidi Shaw, psychology instructor at YVC, talk about chimpanzees and sign language, making science accessible to all students. And Chrissy's gonna talk a minute about um, just how that we're gonna record this session, then we're gonna hear from a, a short introduction from Judy Kelman, and then Heidi will do the show. Okay, so Chrissy, you're on. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thanks to see our folks that come regularly and some new folks. Um, we are recording, so if you don't want your image uh, to be in the recording, go ahead and go to stop video. You can find that on your screen. Please mute during the program. That way the dog barking, the doorbell ringing, that kind of stuff doesn't get into and interrupt our program. I'll, afterwards, I'll be sending a feedback survey link in an email along with um, a video, the, the copy of this um, recording. And we put that on our website. So you can go back and look at all the past uh, recordings and fun times we've had. Thank you. Judy, your oh, turn. My turn, okay. Turn. Uh, I've taught at YBC for years, and so I first met Heidi when we attracted her from her growing up spot in Massachusetts out to Eastern Washington because of our, our population of chimpanzees. You probably all remember Washoe who lived up at Central Washington University. So that's how we got Heidi out here from Massachusetts. And she ended up teaching at YVC. So that's how we first got acquainted. She, she started teaching about 25 years ago. And at the time we were doing these linked classes at YVC, they were called learning communities. And so teachers from di different disciplines would talk with each other and find out what kind of common themes that their courses had. And then they would link the classes together. So you'd have students taking, you know, chemistry and English together, or they'd be taking, in our case, biology and psychology together. So it was really fun because the teachers got to learn a lot from each other. And also the students got to have all of the teachers in the class all the time. So I met Heidi when we were sitting one day trying to decide what kind of a common theme we could have for a biology class and a, and a psychology class. And we both decided that what we valued for our students was that they learn how to think critically rather than magical thinking and that they understand the difference between science and then uh, phony science or pseudoscience and also to understand scientific theories rather than conspiracy theories. So that was the theme for our class and we called it why people believe weird things. And so we had an English teacher decided he liked our theme, so he joined us. So Gordon Kessler taught uh, English composition along with the psych and the biology. So we had a big group of students and we met every morning, all morning for five days a week for the, for the quarter. So it was really a great experience for all of us. And so by being together all that time, we, we shared a lot of our teaching strategies in that course. Um, what Heidi always did when we were teaching together is she always had her students doing research of their own and then they would put together a poster and their, their research team would present it at the end of the quarter to the class. So she was always from the very beginning interested in having um, you know, freshmen and sophomores at the community college actually doing research, not just reading about other people's research. 
So she started a chimp research group at YVC and she invited all of her psych students from, from all different quarters to, to join the psych research team. And I joined the team because I've always been interested in animal behavior. So I wanted to learn about the signing chimps too. So I, I joined up um, in this research group. And what she did was the students would do research and they would write it up as though they were gonna publish it in a journal and they would make a poster. And then she would, she would uh, register them for uh, regional psych conferences in, in, on the West Coast. And so um, they would, she would take the students to the conferences and the students would present their posters and people would walk around and ask them questions and they would tell them about their research. So it was really great for college freshmen and sophomores to get that experience. Since I was on the research team too, I got to go along as their chaperone. So it was really fun for me to go to these site conferences and hear the talks and look at, watch the students um, talking about their research to the other people. And so it was really a great experience. So with no more talk from me, I'll go ahead and introduce my friend, Heidi Shaw. Thank you. And so I'm gonna get my little, uh, let's see. I gotta share my screen and share the sound. Okay. So can everybody see that okay? So we're good. So thank you, Mary Lou, for inviting me. And I could never say no to one of my favorite former bosses. And thank you to Judy for the nice introduction and for covering about half of my presentation. <laughs> um, and actually what Judy didn't tell you was that um, when I got hired on in 1995, she was assigned to be my mentor. They actually had a mentor program back then. And she started then trying to get me to swap up how I taught uh, from lecturing to doing worksheets and a lot more interactive kinds of things. And it was, that learning community where she finally broke me out of my bad habits and really um, opened the door for me to really improve my instruction uh, quite dramatically. So thank you. So I learned about the what used to be called ape language um, studies when I was about five or six. And um, during Saturday morning cartoons, there used to be a show called In the News. And they were one to two minute um, little news stories that were targeted, they were current events that were sort of targeted for things that kids might be interested in. And one of the ones was on Lana the chimpanzee and a researcher by the name of Dwayne Rumba had worked with her and taught her how to use computers, a computer board with a touch screen with these little buttons all over it. And the buttons represented um, words and so she could string words together and so forth and I was just enamored by it and that notion kind of stuck with me and so then time passes the idea is still kind of floating in the back of my head and in the meantime I kind of thought I might want to be a zookeeper and anything but teaching because that's what my parents did um, and in high school I decided that I wanted to talk with chimps and so um I would always escape the, the lunchroom and all the Rubik's Cube social things going on in the lunchroom. And I would escape to the library and I started researching this and I actually tracked down the scientific research about Lana, the chimpanzee. And I found other ape language pro projects that used other equally sort of clumsy kinds of language like, but not really language. Um, and then I came across Project Washoe and in Project Washoe, the researchers actually used a sign language and it actually was American Sign Language. So they were actually using an existing human language that the chimp carried around with her and didn't have to haul some cumbersome language board or pieces, pieces of plastic or a computer. And so it just made so much more sense. And I decided that was, that was what I wanted to do. And, um, so what I'd like to do is show you if I can get this, there we go. So I'm gonna show you, it's about an eight minute video and it's gonna give you the background of Project Washoe. And in the video, you will see Alex, or Alex, Alan and Trixie Gardner, and they're the researchers who started this and they're my major professors. Um, you'll see Washoe the chimp in black and white and you'll see Dar and Tatu, um, infant chimpanzees in the color footage. 
And just so you know ahead of time, my my students are working with records from Dar and Tatu. I'll take a second to get this going. In the late 1960s, even as the first space monkey orbited the Earth, in Reno, Nevada, a development was quietly underway which would prove even more dramatic. A development which was to profoundly alter the historic relationship between apes and men. It was in 1966 that psychologist Alan Gardner of the University of Nevada, along with his psychologist wife Beatrice, began studies that compared the learning ability of chimpanzees and human children to determine just how clever a chimp could be. It was well known from studies in the wild that chimps are intelligent, inventive, perpetually curious creatures. Just gonna pause there for a second. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about orangutans laughing and I just wanted to uh, let people know that the little sounds that you're hearing that sound kind of like breathy pants, kind of, <laughs> that's baby chimps laughing experts at expressing emotion. But the limits of their abilities had hardly begun to be explored. <laughs> the focal point of the gardener study was a female chimp named Washo, 10 months old in this early black and white footage, and in most respects, very much a typical baby. But it was not the gardener's intention to raise Washo as a pet. Instead, they wanted to know whether she could be taught to talk. For a very long time, most comparative psychologists have believed that chimpanzees are smart enough to use a human language. Yet, in many attempts in which chimpanzees lived in a fairly human environment, they seemed unable to pick up a spoken language. It occurred to many of us that perhaps it was a deficit in their vocal cords rather than an intellectual deficit. Perhaps they're unable to make the sounds of human speech. It occurred to us that if we could find a true human language that did not require the sounds of human speech, and if we could then provide the chimpanzees with a suitable environment, a human-like environment, we could find out if they could learn to use a true human language the way human beings learn to use it. As Beatrice Gardner explains, one language in particular attracted their attention. American Sign Language is a true human language with its own vocabulary and its own way of forming sentences, its own rules of grammar, quite different from that in spoken English. It is a language of deaf people. It is a language in which they can talk about anything, any topic that is relevant to their lives. To the gardeners, American Sign Language, or Amislan, seemed made to order. So after learning the language themselves, they prepared to teach it to Washo. A project of this kind requires a special sort of laboratory. There are many things that you can study with caged animals in a barren environment. But if you want to study the development of human language, and if you want to compare the development of the chimpanzees with the development of human children, then you need an interesting and attractive environment, one with many sources of stimulation and one that will stay stimulating for many years. As these scenes filmed by the gardeners show, Washoe's early life was filled with companionship. 
and it was these companions who taught her her first Amisland sign, the two-handed gesture for more. Like any child, whenever the play would stop, Washo demanded more. And she soon learned the correct sign to ask for affection. Opening things required another sign, whether to open a case full of toys or a portable phonograph. The sign for sweet was an inevitable favorite. And after a query to make sure her instructor has understood, Washoe repeats the request and happily collects her reward. Now Washoe asks for a drink and Beatrice Gardner complies. More drink, Dr. Gardner asks. Drink, Washo replies, and the request is granted. Then Washo correctly identifies her image in the mirror. Me, Washo Big Ears, she signs. Here, Dr. Gardner signs, Washo, come hug, and Washo understands. So now, when her friend Susan feigns distress, Washo hurries to the rescue, signing, hug, hug, hug. At three years of age, Washo was already adept at naming things, like the dog in the picture book. Or another kind of dog. Or a cat with long whiskers. Another page, that's another dog. And this one, that's right too, another kind of cat. Four years after she came to live with the gardeners, Washo had learned over 130 signs, using these in daily conversation with her companions, an achievement to shake man's cherished notion of his privileged place as the sole creature endowed with the gift of language. Who's smart, Susan asks. Dr. G, Washo replies. Yes, Dr. G. Who's stupid, Susan asks. Susan's stupid, Washo replies. Who's stupid? Susan's stupid, says Washo. It has... Okay, let me get back to this. Okay, so um, Project Washoe ended in 1970. And at that point, Washoe went with Roger Fouts, who was one of the caregivers um, to Oklahoma and Project Washoe ended at that point. Um, and so this is me back in high school now. The, um, the high school librarian actually helped me track down Roger Fouts, which was where Washoe was, his lab. And I actually wrote him when I was a sophomore in high school and asked him, what do I do as a student in order to do what you do? I want to work in that kind of a lab. And so over the course of a couple of years, we exchanged letters and he gave me advice and so forth. And then when it was close to time to apply for schools, by that point, he had moved his lab to Central Washington University. And so in one of his last letters, he said that he thought that it was very important in his lab that students start getting involved in research 
uh, with the chimps when they were a freshman, because that gave them four years to stay involved in the research and serve as, as longer term friends and companions, as well as research assistants. And that those long term relationships were healthier for the chimps. And so that was really all I needed to hear. And so I applied um, at Central Washington University and I was accepted. And in September 83, I hopped on a Greyhound bus with my guitar and a footlocker in the other hand, and four days later showed up in Ellensburg, uh, Washington. And um, so I actually was an undergraduate there for all four years, and then I did my master's there as well. So I was there nonstop for six years, and then I continued after that. But in those undergraduate years, um, it was the experience was had a profound impact on me as a person and on um, me as a student and on me as a as a scientist. And let me get my little pointer here. Um, so at the, I think something, something is hidden back here. Let me move this for a second. Yeah. So as a, uh, as kind of a socially awkward uh, teenager, the lab, the chimp lab, the research lab provided just a built-in social group, um, a group of friends. It also gave me mentors at multiple levels because I had students at every level um, I was a freshman, there were sophomores, juniors, seniors, plus graduate students, as well as the directors of the research lab who could serve as advisors and mentors. Um, I was coming in from out of state and so I had financial aid and paying out of state tuition and work study as part of it. And so working in the research lab was my job. So I got to earn money. Um, I developed expertise relatively quickly and um, I was pretty good at what I did. And so I sort of raised up in the human, uh, the hierarchy of human primates, whoops, um, and developed expertise. And with expertise, I also developed a lot of um, confidence and some other things. And I'm gonna look down so that I don't miss some of the things. Um, I also worked as a member of a team, which for me as kind of a loner was a really good experience learning to trust other people and do things um, with other folks was good. I gained um, supervisory experience. I ended up also training and teaching the newer people coming in. I learned how to schedule, which I've, I've learned since is a really good skill to have. Um, I gave public talks. I, I was um, here at a time when we were switching from mainframes to desktop computers. And so I, I learned both of these, those sort of platforms for data entry and data analysis. Um, I learned how to use sophisticated video recording equipment um, and also editing equipment. I gained um, experience cooking for a crowd or at least, at least large eaters. Um, we had to experience foraging through the, the grocery store garbage piles in order to, to find salvageable food for the chimps when the budget was, was pretty reduced. And then I got to do pretty amazing things, which um, included peer reviewing scientific articles and also contributing to the new federal regulations that at the time that were coming out that um, related to captive primates of all types. Um, and in addition to skills like that, I also learned some kind of important lessons about science and maybe even life in general. Um, I learned that science is messy and anything that I had learned about science in my junior high and high school was nothing like what I was learning in the research lab, that, that it takes so much persistence that you make so many errors and um, you do so many, so many failed things before you finally get it all all together. So what makes it into the published record is is incomplete. And I learned that um, making breakthroughs um, is a result of persistence. So it's important to persist in order to, to make breakthroughs. But I also learned sometimes breakthroughs come from letting go of where you are and what your what your ideas are. 
and to be open to, to new kinds of things. Um, I learned that it's worth time. It's worth the time that it takes to do high quality work. Um, a really important one for me was that critique and harsh questions and challenging questions and suggestions for change um, in science and academics is about the ideas and the work. It's not about me. And um, I learned that quality science can only happen uh, as a team, that you can't do science by yourself and have it be um, the high quality that you can when it's with a team. And some practical things I learned that um, sleep can always be made up later. And that a uh, big one that speaking in public does not result in death, which is important for me too. Um, so when I got hired um, at YVC, I was still working on my dissertation research and, um, and I had benefited so much from my undergraduate research experience that I wanted to bring that with me to YVC. And I can remember at my um, interview, I can remember asking, so will I be able to continue research you know, with students down here? And Ellie Heffernan, who I know a lot of you know, know her, um, she, when I asked, she said, well, you can do whatever you want on your own time, but we're a teaching institution. <laughs> so so um, I, I took her up on it and I did continue to do it on my own time with students. Um, and at that, so this this was the research that I was doing um, at the time. So I was using video records, and the I was looking at gaze direction, so where the chimps were looking when they were signing. And so this is Dar, and this is the guy as an adult who you saw in that very first opening shot. So that was his baby picture. This is Dar as an adult with his big ears. So he's signing drink right here and he's looking directly over at the human. And I've got to move this so you can see. So the uh, this is Mark Bodemer. Um, so he's sitting across from the chimp and now he's reflected in the mirror. So what I was looking at with this dissertation was looking to see how the chimpanzees coordinate their eye gaze in conversation and do they use the same um, gaze direction cues when they're signing as human speakers do in conversation. And so my students weren't experts in chimpanzees, so they couldn't help me with the chimp side of it here, but they're, they're very much experts in humans and gaze direction. And so um, they were able to watch the videos and we had to record down to a tenth of a second and they would record um, whether Mark was looking toward or away from the chimpanzees. And so that took me a few years to finish. So that's what they did for that. And then the when I finished the dissertation, the findings from the dissertation led me to do some work with human pointing. And so the new generation of students now is helping out and they helped me actually design the experiment. Uh, actually, technically it wasn't an experiment, um, but they helped me develop the protocols. They helped me recruit subjects. They helped me obtain informed consent. They helped me with the data collection, which was pretty, pretty tricky to do. Um, and that actually took quite a while. And so a new generation of students actually helped with um, that analysis, let's see if I can get this again. Um, put this over here with the analysis. And the analysis um, consisted again of watching videotapes down to the 10th of a second. And they recorded which finger people pointed with. We were looking at form, um, the palm orientation, whether it was to the side, down, or up looked at the thumb position, whether it was parallel to the palm over here or whether it was perpendicular to the palm. And then the position of the non-pointing fingers. So, um, well, let's take a look at this one. They're tightly curved, a little loose, loosely curved, and then they're just all over the place here. Um, 
And so with the pointing research, I hadn't gotten bold enough to take students to conferences yet. And so the students and I worked on it and they would co-author the papers and then I would take it and present it at conferences. And then um, one of my students finally um, sort of took me up on it and I, I offered her the opportunity. And so she presented um, one of the analyses at an international conference in Mexico. So um, that was the first one. And then Christy Rasmussen, who was a former research student of mine, who now works at, has worked at YVC for quite a while. She was the next one to present uh, one of the analyses at a, at a conference. Um, okay. So throughout my time at YVC, um, I've always collaborated with Alan Gardner, who's right here. Um, Trixie Gardner, who's, you can see her in a couple of places here and over here. Um, she died in 95, just before I, I got hired on at YVC. Um, but I continued to collaborate with Alan Gardner on a variety of projects and publications. And periodically he would complain that the work in his lab wasn't moving along very fast. And I would always volunteer to help. And he'd say, well, what can you do at a distance? And so he complained one more time. And so I, I kind of pushed and I said, well, I can, I can help from a distance. Um, you know, I can recruit students and here's what we could do. So he was skeptical, but he agreed. And so he had a second copy of all of his records from their second project and he was willing to give them to me. And so I drove down to Reno, picked up all the, it was like 30 plus boxes of, of research records and hauled them back to Ellensburg. And, um, and that's, that was about 15 years ago. And I've, I've been working with students on those records ever since. And at the time, the, um, well, actually, let me, Move that again. Um, let me back up for a second. Um, so the gardeners, and this is Trixie again, the gardeners research program has always, and I would argue even the, the program that I started with under Roger Fouts, have always included non-traditional students as research assistants. And with the gardeners, they needed people who were good with infant chimpanzees. And when you think of traditional scientists, you don't think of, of, you know, scientists on the ground, you know, moving around in the dirt, you know, finger painting with babies and chasing babies and playing with, you know, hammers and hoops, um, toys like this. So they needed people who loved working with kids and baby chimps. And so um, some of the most important people who uh, worked on this project were actually stay at home moms who had successfully raised children and were great with chimpanzee babies. He also had some, or they also had some high school students um, who were proficient signers and they had members of the community whose only credential was that they were native signers. Um, and that's of course, in addition to graduate students. Um, okay, so back to, um, Yakima. So I continued that tradition with, um, with my students. And what I have found and will continue to argue is that anyone, whether student or community member, can contribute substantially and meaningfully in the work that, that I do um, with these records, as long as folks can read and write um, I'll say proficiently, doesn't mean that they're perfect, but, and also accept critique and, and that's it. And I've never had to impose any prerequisites on this. And I've had students help who came to me with good grades, but I've also had some students who had very poor grades and were looking for a place to kind of fit in. I've had students who have needed um, developmental math and English. I, and I've also had students who came with four-year degrees and were doing some prerequisite work at YVC. I've had um, high schoolers. I've had um, I've had middle-aged women returning to school. I've had middle-aged men re who returned to school. 
So I've had all sorts of students with varying abilities um, and um, lots of ethnic, ethnic backgrounds in there. I've had German, Australian, um, Mexican, um, those three I can come up with off the top of my head. Um, so anyway, so I had recruited some students to help with Alan's work and what, um, what we were doing was um, helping Alan's and his students proofread. And they had been entering their data, their records into a database and they had been entering a lot and had been backlogged on proofreading. And the proofreading is where you're cleaning out the errors. And so that was preventing them from doing analyses. And so we were helping with the proofreading. And this was all on paper. And um, we would, our Yakima team would meet on the phone on conference calls with the Reno team, and they would train us in what we were supposed to do. And um, so what we did was proofread um, in partners. And so one partner would read aloud the handwritten record. And this handwritten record is very neat. Um, but as you'll see in some of the later ones, they were not quite so neat and legible. Um, so one of them would read this aloud and they had to read clearly, articulately, and at a pace where the person over here could follow along and listen carefully and catch errors. And so this person would be reading, M choose chicken till the flavor gone, then spit it out period, previously comma, M has been, and so forth. And this one would be watching to make sure the commas were there, making sure that the spelling was um, okay and making sure nothing was missed and marking the errors on the paper copies. And so periodically I would pack up the, the paper copies and would send them down and they would make the changes and, and we'd get a new big batch of papers. So this took a couple of years and then that project was done. And this work wasn't, we didn't do any kind of analysis. It was all proofreading. But as the students were reading through it, they were of course reading it all and seeing all the, the interesting behaviors. So after that was done, I had some time to look at the records that Alan had, had given me in the second copy. And there were all sorts of records, so many more types of records than I was familiar with. And there were, um, these are all a type of record called a, called a behavior of the week. And those records, in those records, the researchers at the time would um, prepare a report for the weekly strategy meeting. And they would look through the diary style notes that were taken and pull out all the most interesting behaviors for that week for that particular chimp. And then they would report those out. So these behaviors of the week were like summaries of the week. And so this was the particular type of record that we were gonna focus on in the next um, phase. But when I took a look at the records that we had, there, there were a ton of records, none of which had been digitized yet. And so they were all paper copies and most of it hadn't been entered into the computer. And so um, I was kind of worried because these records um, could, could burn up and disappear. And so we started a sort of a multi-pronged approach. And um, so the first, the first sort of prong was that students who were just interested in, um, in helping, but not really interested in the, the research questions um, would help scan. And so we were scanning lots of documents. And so that was taking place. They were scanning and creating an index of everything that we had. A second prong was that we were, as folks were scanning, we would pull out this behaviors of the week and that group of students would enter the records into a spreadsheet. So they would be 
typing this that was on paper into the computer. And then we would proofread in partners just like we did before to make sure that there weren't errors. And so the folks scanning would scan a year of one of the chimps. So they'd scan a year of Moja and then a year of Dar and then a year of Tatu and a year of Pili. And then as they were working on year two, then the folks entering data would be entering year one and proofreading year one. And so we did it in kind of a, um, almost like a terraced fashion. And so um, currently we're in year five. So this is still all ongoing. And one thing that I'd like to point out here is some of the records are nice and easily legible. Some, you can see this is all really dark. And um, for all of you folks, you can, I'm sure, read this without too much trouble, but our students don't read cursive well. So our students are having to decipher cursive. And then we also have records that look like this that are all in cursive and very faded. So it's it's a challenge for the students. Um, okay. So then um, as they're scanning and then we're entering, um, as we're entering and getting enough of a particular record, we started doing analyses. And so students interested in actually asking questions and figuring out how to answer them would work on the analyses. And in these posters, you can see the topics. This one is attachment. This is also attachment. And this is laughing and smiling. And what we would do is analyze um, a particular behavior and then compare it to the human um, behavior in the same age human child. And so just to show you what I meant before by sort of that terrorist fashion, not quite sure what word I'm looking for, but in this poster presentation, you can see that the, the chimp here is Dar. So we were only analyzing Dar's records for this signs of attachment poster. And then by the time we got here, there was, we had analyzed Peely's records and Dar's records. And so we had a bigger, we had a larger sample that we could compare with human infants. Um, so these were two of the topics. We also studied fear. Um, and in this particular um, poster, it focused on um, the fear behavior itself. And so the students would go through the records and identify the types of fear behaviors. Um, so there were vocalizations, uh, they would respond in fear by withdrawing or avoiding something, seeking help, aggressively attacking uh, the feared thing and other kinds of things. And we also looked at empathy. Empathy is the most recent thing that we did. Um, and this one, you can see that this behind the box here gets up to 24 months. Let me move this around a little bit again. Um, so this, oops. So in this report, we had been able to cover tw uh, 24 months. And then in this one, we were able to add the third year um, to, the, to the finding. And what I did here was I just pulled out, I've been talking a lot about records and data and so forth. And I just wanna give you a chance to kind of read some of these, um, these excerpts from the data records that the students are reading. And this post, this comes from a poster presentation about empathy. And this particular part of it was the chimps engaging in what's called pro-social behavior in response to another person's distress. And so these were examples that illustrated that particular type of empathetic behavior. And I wasn't thinking that this little box would be here. So I'll move it up here so you can see it.
And Mary Lou, I'm going to ask you to give me a, a sign when you think that I've allowed enough time. OK. OK, that enough? OK. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, OK. So um, the kinds of, um, let me get this again. Oh. So in all of the, the research projects that, they've, that the students have engaged in that I've described so far, um, they've had to do a lot of things like they've done extensive amounts of writing and in that writing, they're also working together and improving their writing. Um, so it's collaborative writing. They're having to read a lot. And so when I mentioned that students participate in this who re have required developmental reading classes, in this project, um, the students are getting a lot of practice reading. So um, I think that's a benefit to those folks. They're also reading aloud a lot. And I've noticed that that's a challenge when they first start working with us. And then that's a skill that actually develops pretty quickly. They get comfortable correcting their own errors and other errors. Um, they actually learn cursive and they are so proud of it. And it's funny for me because my office, I have, if you remember like second grade classrooms with the cursive alphabet posted around the classroom, that's what my office, I've got letters. <laughs> And, and the students, that's how they're learning cursive. But um, so they actually learn to decipher it. Um, they do a lot of public speaking in small context, just with our little group. And then they, they get to practice in other contexts. Um, sometimes they'll give presentations even to the board of trustees or the administrative council. Um, they identify patterns of behavior. And even when they're not doing it as part of an analysis, in our research meetings, people will start bringing up, oh my gosh, I've noticed this pattern a lot. Um, they contribute to what we call operational definitions in science. Um, so how we're gonna define empathy for the purposes of our, our um, study. And they have to learn how to apply those different, the definitions to the data records. They end up learning a lot of new vocabulary um, and some that's specific to uh, the cultural times, oops, like um, they didn't know what Banaka Blast was. And a lot of you might remember that. Um, they have to decipher poor handwriting. They have to copy things verbatim, which deals with being able to be precise. They're doing a lot of typing and they're learning a lot of vocabulary that's unique to chimpanzee and chimpanzee behavior. Um, and I've taken the students, as Judy pointed out, I've taken students to conferences. Um, and here you can see our little Motley crew. And what was fun here was that this student right here is 17 and in high school with a baby. This student is a mom with a year old and then just a regular old generic college student. This is a graduate student from Central who I had collaborated with on a project for this conference as well. And so she joined our team. And so it was just a great experience. Judy is actually on the other end of the camera taking this picture. So she came with as a, as a chaperone because these folks were out of control. <laughs> not, not. Um, and you can see um, this 17 year old over here just behaving very professionally at the conference, getting involved in discussions. And this is a poster session. And so when you saw those posters earlier, at conferences, for those who haven't been to conferences um, like this, you make those posters and then for an hour, you've put your poster up on your board and you stand with your poster and people walk by and will stop and ask you questions about your poster. And sometimes they just walk up and say, can you tell me about your research? And the students just have to tell about the research. Um, and so it's a great way for the students to practice repeating um, what they know and practice how to say things differently and so forth. And my favorite trip, and Judy was on this one, as you can see right here, um, was back at I think 2012 or 14, the Rocky Mountain Psychology, uh, Psychological Association 
um, annual convention was in Reno. And Reno is where the gardeners started this whole project. And this is Alan Gardner. Let me move this again. Um, and so it just seemed wrong not to take students to this. And we were on a shoestring budget. Um, and Christy Rasmussen, who I mentioned earlier, who was just magic when it came to travel arrangements, um, also came as a chaperone on this trip. And so these three students were working with these data. And Christy drove them in a van down to Reno and Judy and I flew down and um, Alan Gardner hosted us and we were able to, to stay at his house in the guest quarters. Um, and so, and I used my, my food budget uh, to buy groceries and we ate family style with Alan every evening. Um, and this was just a great opportunity uh, for the students to actually see where the chimps lived all of the locations that they read about in the in their records, the, to see the toys that they had, to see the um, the house, you know, where the chimps would break in once in a while, where the chimps would have brunch and so forth. Um, and then this right here is uh, Alan Gardner show was showing us an unpublished film um, that he was in the process of publishing, and so we were upstairs in his little living room sitting around an old VCR watching uh, an old film. And the students had all sorts of time to interact with Alan Gardner. And we had a research meeting together with the students who we've been um, in conference calls with. So it was just a, it was a really um, fun time for me to share, to share my, my background with the students. Um, and I put this poster here. Um, I know that you can't you can't see the details, but what's important uh, for me in this is that um, the students on here. There's four students, uh, four students. Mary Klein and Jadrian Gonzalez both worked with me at YVC, and then they transferred over to the University of Washington. But they continued to work with me and with the other students. Katie Bushelman was in the same research team as Mary Klein and Jadrian Gonzalez. And she left and uh, moved to Denver and went to the Community College of Denver. And we all continued to work on this with a new student, Sarah Brooks Canale in Yakima. And we all contributed to this poster and the Western Psychological Association was held in Portland. And all of us convened down there, except Katie couldn't make it but we all um, showed up there and presented our work. And it's this kind of collaborative work that I dream of continuing to do. Um, so, um, um, let me just take a quick peek. So over the years, like I said, I've had all sorts of students and in terms of before I focused on kind of skills, but I've had all sorts of students from geeky students who were just like me, who just loved learning anything and any kind of research would have been interesting um, to students who were sort of like fan club members who really liked my class and just wanted to hang around. Um, and then I had students who I would encourage to participate because they weren't fitting in well. And I could see the I could see them being sort of ostracized because of odd social behaviors or something, and I would recruit those students, hoping to get them in. And um, I also actively invited students who were the quiet sort, who were really good students but quiet and kind of hid out in the back of the room. And I would kind of tap them, and say, you know, I think you would be good at this research thing. And I was surprised at how many took me up on, on my offer. And um, I think sometimes students are, are um, don't understand how much they act, how much potential they have. Um, so um, I often wonder kind of why students volunteer to do research like this, um, because the practical issue is that they're sitting in a closed room like you saw before um, 
and they're not out in the field doing exciting things. And so I often wonder, well, why would, why would they do this? And um, I have never tried to quantify it. And um, I'm gonna let other people do that. I would rather learn about chimps. But some of the things that I've noticed that may contribute to why they do it and why they stay, sometimes I've had students volunteer for two straight years and sometimes they even pay to volunteer because they get it for credit. And I do know that before I start in this, I do know that there's a large uh, contingent of students who transfer from other schools, other semester schools, and they're coming to YVC for the nursing program. And when they transfer their credits in, they end up being one credit short of the credits that they need for psychology. And so here they are needing one credit and they used to take a full five credit class. And then at some point, somebody noticed my research credit. And ever since then, I, I have anywhere from four to 12 nursing students every, every year take me for one credit. And so those students, I know what they're getting out of it. The fun thing is that they get, they actually enjoy it. Um, but the other ones, I kind of wonder if these play a role um, I found that a lot of research time, not a lot, I should say, some research time turns into advising sessions. And sometimes it's me being the advisor and sometimes it's their classmates or the teammates. I see that their confidence increases as they develop competence. And I'm gonna jump over here and say um, that once the students show competence, I actually let them train the new people coming in and I just find that they, they really enjoy doing that. Um, I see that students start drawing connections um, between things. And sometimes it's the research in their other classes. Sometimes it's the research and what their children are doing at home. Um, sometimes it's what we're doing with what's going on in the news. Um, I see students getting increasingly more comfortable disagreeing with others and challenge asking good questions and challenging and making suggestions without apologizing as if they know that it's okay. Um, I find that awkward students find friends, um, sometimes significant others. Um, I've, I've seen quiet people become boldly or quietly bold or boldly quiet, I don't know, quietly bold, I guess. Um, I, I see the students learning this vocabulary, but, but not just learning it, but like embracing it and, and being comfortable with this new sophisticated terminology. And I see the students developing a community where they have inside jokes that don't even include me. You know, they're bringing tamales or, or cookies or cake, making birthday cakes for one another. Um, so there's a lot of things that have nothing to do really with the actual research so much as the the experience itself. Um, mm. So I'm continuing to do this. In fact, I, I even started a nonprofit um, that I'm hoping to develop more, more uh, in the near future. And none of this could happen um, without a lot of people in my life, my parents, Ruth and David, and Ruth is actually in the audience here, um, and my family. My major professors, Alan and Trixie Gardner, um, were just remarkable people. The 200 plus students who have assisted me, and I say students, but individuals who have assisted me with this research, a whole host of people um, at YVC. Um, and these, these are more, um, yeah, they've contributed to all sorts of different things. And then what you can't see underneath um, is really most, uh, Importantly, Washo, Moja, Pili, Tatu, and Dar, because they essentially sacrificed their life for the sake of science, even though they didn't choose to do that. So um, I wanna thank you for having me and for listening. And I hope I'm okay for time. Yeah. Uh, and I'm more than happy to take any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you so much, Heidi. That was fascinating. What questions do people have? I'm, I'm so impressed with uh, the way you think about 
what students have, how, how you benefited and how your students have benefited. That's amazing. Betty Ann? Uh, I'm sure a lot of people ask you this, but what happens to the chimps after you finished, after they've been studied? A really good question. So um, when Washa was little, she was four um, when they decided that the project was done and it was done for a couple of different reasons. One was because the grant ran, ran out. One was because one of her favorite people was graduating and moving on, Roger Fouts. And also the gardeners got Washo when she was about 10 months old and that's an estimate. Um, and she was producing signs within a month. And so they knew immediately that in terms of a method that they needed to replicate the project with younger babies. And how they acquire younger babies is an ethical issue that I don't know if I wanna get into, but um, so in that case, Washoe ended up going with Roger Fouts and ended up in a colony of chimpanzees, which was very traumatic for her. And she called them, what did she call them? Black monkeys, I think, <laughs> uh, because she did not identify with them at all. Hmm. So that was very traumatic. Um, but they ended up in captivity. And that's a, a another whole ethical issue. That um, and I'll just say, I will say up right here that that I, um, if if you ask me today, would I do this project again in the future? I would say absolutely not. Completely unethical, but the ethics were different at the time, and so I think the the reason that it would be unethical to do it now is in part because of the research that they did showing it. So it's a very it's a, it's a real ethical quandary. Um, and people who work in this project were also very involved in animal welfare. So it's a, it's a real struggle for us ethically. Thank you. Linda, uh, you, your, your sound is off, Linda. Now your picture's up, there you go. Okay, there we go. Heidi, thank you, this was fascinating. I was able to visit the chimpanzees uh, at, YV, at um, Central before they moved. And I, I remember it so vividly and it was a wonderful experience. How are the chimps doing that were moved? I, I'm, I'm thinking that Washoe isn't alive any longer. Yeah, so Washoe died my years may be a little off. I think Washoe yeah. died in 2004. I think Moja in 2007. Dar died suddenly in 2012, which left Tatu and Lulis. And so they moved to Canada in 2014. And I'll say Tatu is adjusting, has adjusted well. And she's, she was, personality-wise, she's a, she's a trooper. Um, and she's a tough, what my dad would have called a tough cookie. <laughs> and Lulis, not so much. He, um, he's doing as well as can be expected, but he, it was interesting. He had a rough start to life. His mother was in um, some kind of nasty research with, she had electrodes implanted in her head. She wasn't, she wasn't um, caring for him. So he had kind of like an aunt-like figure in his life. And then he was adopted out and Washoe adopted him um, when he was about 10 months old, which is coincidental. Um, so he was raised as Washoe's son and Washoe was the dominant chimp, which made him second in command. So he was very much a spoiled, spoiled person. And I, I love him to death, but he's, he's very spoiled. And so he didn't have a lot of experience kind of standing up for himself. And um, he, took, he took the death of his mother hard, hard and Dar was his next best friend. And so he took the death of Dar very hard. And so he's, he's struggling, I think, um, socially because he didn't, um, he always had somebody protecting him. And um, so he doesn't really know how to, how to interact that well. Um, 
So he's he's doing he's doing as as well as can be expected, and I think he's doing better up there than he would have been here in isolation with with just the two of them. So, is there still a sanctuary in Clay Ellum? Yes, and they're doing they're doing incredible work, and they just got um, three. So they had the Clay Ellum seven, and then they just got three more. Um, a, a year or so ago and um yeah they are they're fantastic people they're just doing great work those are all you, former research chimps aren't they that yes awesome? and uh the two folks who head up that um that sanctuary worked at the chimp lab in in ellensburg at central mm -hmm. And they went off and got degrees else master or second masters, I think, elsewhere, and one in law, and I'm not sure what the other one was in, and then came back and, and set the sanctuary up. Yeah. So Heidi, how did the students respond to the ethical issues? Did you talk with them? Or did they ask you about that? Or were they not as involved with that? The current students? Yeah. No, the students who were did research with you. At YVC or at yeah yeah YVC, you know they don't. Um, They're kind no, of removed. I, I don't bring it up if they don't bring it up, uh -huh. and some of them have brought it up, and we've talked about it. Um, and um, the gardeners had a very strange. Um, I can't say it's strange, but I think it was self-preservation. They didn't want to hear bad things, mm -hmm. and so they kind of stayed removed from. Um, from the chimps after they left, mm -hmm. which was really hard. When I when I came to the lab in 83, they they actually came to visit. And it was very interesting because Tatu and Dar had just left about a year and a half before that. So when I got there, Dar was still he was six, I think. Um, and so the Alan and Trixie walked in the door and Tatu and Dar were just so excited. And I think they thought that they were going home. Mm -hmm. And then they came back two years later and nobody would, none of the chimps would have anything to do with them. Mm -hmm. So it was a, um, yeah. So, I mean, if you think about it, it's a, they were kind of abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's so many, there's so many ethical issues that are, um, that get brought up and um, none of them were of my making, but they still, I think they still weigh heavy. <laughs> um, yeah. Other questions? I, I just, I just find it fascinating how you've been able to use the research that you're doing with students as such a learning experience for them. I think it's just fantastic, Heidi. Congratulations on that. I mean, Thank just you. seeing them doing these presentations at national conferences, that's just great. It's yeah. really great. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's really mutually beneficial mm -hmm. because like I said, I can't do it on my own. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's until now with zoom and things, it's, it, it's harder to collaborate when you don't have something like the zoom thing. So this is actually opening up a lot more possibilities for, for me, so. Good, well, any last questions? Yes. Rex? Because of the ethical issues, does that mean that um, this type of research is going to be coming to an end or is it going to be continued? So this project will end when Tatu and Lulis pass. So nobody that I know of who have worked in this project supports the idea that anybody should do it again because the, the ethical issues from taking a baby from their mother to having to put an individual in a cage with no crime associated with it, um, knowing that they're gonna live 50 years is just unthinkable. Yeah. And so not everybody thinks like that, but for the folks who worked with these chimpanzees, 
it's a worldview changing experience to sit down and have a conversation with another species that's meaningful. And um, the idea that they have to be on the other side of bars just because they're strong and a little impulsive um, just doesn't sit well. And so, um, yeah. So what, what's the research that's going on, um, or if you can say briefly, in, in Ellensburg? What are they looking at now? So there, so the chimps, I, I didn't mention it formally, somebody uh, commented on it, but uh, the, the two remaining chimps. Political. We know that there are a number of investigations. Um, so they moved to Canada and they're in a sanctuary and they don't do any research up there. Okay. And um, the facility closed down. Actually, I shouldn't say they're not doing research. They're doing, they're doing some, some research with with records but as far as i know they're not doing any new research okay yeah heidi do you think chimpanzees talk to each other is there a chatter that you don't understand i would say yes they talk to one another and our yeah. chimps talk to one another with sign language so we could actually see it but they certainly have they certainly have um a gestural form of communication. Um, yeah, they don't, they don't, I would argue that they don't communicate vocally. Let me rephrase that. They don't engage in anything like conversation vocally. Um, their vocalizations seem to be equivalent to our emotional vocalizations. And so in the wild, when you see, if you, if you follow Jane Goodall's work at all, you see you know, chimps gesturing and doing all sorts of, of gesture communication, gestural communication, but their vocalizations are reserved for um, alarm calls and excitement about food and um, laughter and cries, um, that kind of thing. And so I wouldn't say there's chatter, but gestural chatter, certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, Heidi, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate this. It's been great. So, thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Oh. Very interesting. Now, I just want to say just a couple words about what's coming up next, you guys. We've got um, on March 17th is our next our, our next Zoom talk. Uh, on the on the 10th of March, we're going to send you the link to the Yakima Coffee House Poets, but we aren't having a presentation. But on the 17th, we've got Nick Valadez, who's going to talk about the five wishes tool to discuss or document uh, and document or possibly update your end of life choices and care choices. And then on March 31st, Brooke Creswall is going to do a presentation on how this Yakima Symphony got started and started and started. <laughs> Um, and then we've got on April 7th, Mike Mullen is going to do a program on recognizing and avoiding common scams and fraud and considering security issues that you need to think about. And watch your the airwaves for a group coming up next week, Tuesday, um, called Tech Tips where we're gonna just try to touch base with you on problem solving and finding resources for tech frustrations that we have. So join us for that if you're interested. So <laughs> all that coming up and Heidi again, thanks so much. And we're glad that Ruth, we're glad you were here too. You should be proud of this lady. I know you are. Thanks Thank again, you. Heidi. Oh, hi Erwina, good to see you. Okay. Thanks, Take care. Good afternoon, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.